right, big hand for Ronnie. It helps me with video editing. Awesome. So, uh, my name is Ronnie, um, and I'm here to talk about hotel and continuous feedback. Um, just out of curiosity, who here is familiar with open telemetry? Oh, okay. Uh, so hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll all be kind of familiar with open telemetry, also kind of aware why it's really important to, to know about it. Uh, just really two words about me. Um, most of my career have been kind of uh, a developer and a product manager, and then a developer again, and then a product manager again. I couldn't quite uh, make up my mind about whether uh, I could actually work on requirements without coding or work on coding without requirements. But um, eventually I got it fig figured out. Um, however, throughout that process, I think one of the things that fascinated me mo most was development processes and how can we improve how we develop. <laughs> so to basically explain what, what what bothered me the most and what kind of prompted me to explore open telemetry um i want to tell you a story of one of my developers and we're, we're going to call him Bill. and this hypothetical developer has a not so hypothetical task of how do we get code in, into production um and it used to be a very simple task so when i got started like maybe you know 20 something years ago um Coding was about um, finishing the feature you were working on, wrapping it up real nicely, taking it across the hall to the QA department, saying, you know, this is the thing, now you test it. Then, you know, some philosophical arguments would ensue about what's a feature, what's a bug, and eventually it would kind of roll on into production and you would never hear about it again, except when it breaks and then, of course, uh, you, you might uh, return to it. But that changed, right? So today, when we complete features, then uh, we write tests, we worry about the test plan for that feature. Uh, sometimes we work you know, all the way to deployment, Helm files, Terraform. It kind of becomes a part of our job and something that I kind of asked my you know, teams I work with to do because you, know, it's, you need to own this all the way to production. This is your responsibility. And we got really good at doing all of those things, except the question is, and let's say Bill did all of these things in, in an exemplary manner, what happens when the code gets to production? So let me ask you, you've just, you're Bill, you've just finished your task, you've rolled your feature all the way to production, you've written great tests, CI, CD, everything is working, what's your next step? What do you do now? You call the survey guys, say that code is in production. Now it's your turn. See, that's the, the, that's the guy across the hall that you tell them this is your problem now. Um, and I have to tell you, like, um, what I asked uh, Bill to do, I told him, well, you roll this out, check. Does, does it work? Does it work well? Does it work at all? You know, I've seen multiple horror stories of meticulously written code that was just one bad if statement away from actually getting executed so and we would only find that you know months later that oh no that amazing code that we we, we checked in it never got called right so there is a certain set of things that you want to do after you push it into production however time after time after time what bill actually did was move on to the next feature mm -hmm. And I couldn't seem to change that. Like no matter how much I tried, no matter how much I, I was kind of putting dashboards in front of people, it, it, it just didn't, didn't work. Now, a part of it is my fault as a product manager and it's called uh, the new feature bias. Basically, a developer is proudly telling you you completed the feature and you only care about the next thing. And there's a reason for that because we're very roadmap driven, roadmaps are linear. We always think about the next thing and the next thing. And there is no room in the roadmap for fixing things that already kind of rolled into production. But beyond that, when I looked at kind of the DevOps model, it seemed to me like something was really missing here in the way that we approach this problem. So I'm going to have to ask you, and this is, by the way, just some uh, random image of the DevOps look like I grabbed from uh, the web. But something you'll notice right away, or it might take you some time to notice is that something is off 
in this uh, and many other variations of the DevOps tool. And yes. I mean, I'll just say Waldo is very easy to find here. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, however, what's not that easy to find is that we have here um, three amazing tools for building continuous integration, deploying operations, and so on. There is one segment here in the DevOps group called continuous feedback. The author of this uh, graph, uh, this diagram, thought Salesforce was a good tool to include here for some reason, but be that as it may, there are no tools for continuous feedback. Like, what's up with that? We were great at rolling out features into production. We're great at kind of doing the ops monitoring, but where is the feedback that comes back to Bill and tells him, you did good, you did bad. This is how this code works. You mean the donate button? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So whereas, um, when we code, we have lots of feedback from our local environment. When we run our tests, we have some limited feedback, limited because it's kind of a yes, no thing, less qualitative, but we have no production feedback. Um, and this is where I kind of thought to myself, if only we actually had access to objective data about our code, that was instant and very easy to get to. And this is kind of the perfect segue to open telemetry. So open telemetry is a great technology that lets you do that. Now, why is it important? Open telemetry is absolutely not revolutionary. It's something that it, it builds on technologies that existed before. Uh, it's a rehash of, of different, maybe good ideas. Uh, there is nothing uh, completely new about it, but it is extremely important. And the reason it's extremely important because everyone agrees on it. And that didn't happen before. So instead of having a million proprietary specs or protocols by Splunk or Datadog or you know uh, client uh, weird clients or agents or things that are you know um, interfering or mangling your code in, in in weird ways that you will never know about. This is a very open, simple, structured way to do observability that everybody has accepted as how to do observability. And this creates two things. It creates an ecosystem because suddenly tools can kind of say, well, we're going to provide value on top of observability and we're going to take into account this spec and we're not making, uh, we're not kind of uh, making a wild bet here because this is the accepted standard. And then the other thing that happened is that if I'm a tool developer, if I'm a platform developer, if I'm writing Django, if I'm writing Flask, if I'm writing Fast API, if I'm writing uh, um, an, an, a Postgres adapter for, for Python, I'm going to support instrumentation for open telemetry because it's the one thing I need to do instead of, again, worrying about many different standards and, and, and variants. So as a result of that, the journey from getting from zero data about my application as built to having too much data even more than I can handle, became almost instantaneous. So to demonstrate that, we don't have a lot of time. Um, I did create a sample application. You can find it uh, on this uh, page. I will send uh, the notes as well. Um, I was trying, you know, if there is one thing that I'm, I'm kind of almost allergic to, it is CRUD apps. So apps that try to show something that's actually important, but they just do create, update, delete, get, which just doesn't exist in the real world. So I was trying to do something a bit more complex. In this case, as I was watching the Harry Potter movies with my kids at the time, I decided to create an API for the Green Gods watch um, that uses RabbitMQ and FastAPI and a bunch of uh, other technologies just to make it interesting. Now, you can look at the example, which is, uh, I think, uh, kind of an interesting use of, of, of open telemetry, but the more important thing is that it was almost immediate to get data out of this application, even without making any code changes, by, just by activating the kind of out of the box instrumentation for open telemetry for all of these different packages. If it's Fast API, if it is SQL Alchemy, if it is Pika for RabbitMQ, HTTPX for, uh, for making an external API call, 
all of these already exist and it's more like turning the lights on. So as Bill, I was able to get a lot of data about my application right away. Now to complement that, open telemetry also allows you to kind of create your own um, manual um, kind of stands and traces. So for those of you who are not familiar, here is kind of a one second brief about stands and traces. Traces are basically a flow through the system. So for example, here I have a flow that uh, or a journey that a user would go through if he were to, uh, let's say, request a vault appraisal. So we would make an API call, then it would go to RabbitMQ, then it would go to a different service altogether in my microservice architecture, this worker service that would access Postgres. That entire journey is called a trace. And open telemetry just gives you access to it. So you can kind of visualize exactly what happened when the user accessed this API. The same time, spans allow you to see more granular, a more granular uh, way to specify exactly what happened in each part of the trace so that I can, uh, well, uh, I was calling this a specific API and there was a get request and a check for permissions and validations and so on. So a lot of this information we get immediately just by enabling all the instrumentation. And some of it we can augment just like logs by adding manual uh, traces. So in this case, we're creating a span called authenticate called owner and key. And from this moment on, you can think about it like logs on steroids. You get this information about what was, uh, that this happened, but you also understand who called it, when it started, when it ended, and a lot of contextual uh, information about it. So let's take a look at a very uh, quick demonstration. Um, I've taken the Vault API. In this case, I'm using an open source uh, tool called Jaeger. Um, so let's take our API that's defined here. Uh, I'm going to call um, an appraise operation. And execute it. And then um, I can look, Jaeger is just an open source tool that allows me to visualize the traces that are being sent by uh, the application. So we can take a look and immediately we see everything I just mentioned. So basically this is the entire flow. You can see it spans multiple services. This is the worker, this is the service and everything here uh, either comes automatically just by enabling this instrumentation, like in this case, the HTTP call or the database uh, queries that were uh, going on here, or and then it transitions over to the worker, and we see it as kind of one bit, one trace that allows us to visualize exactly what happened when this code was called by the user. So this is great, right? Um, now the question is. And and there's a lot more to say about open telemetry. Um, but the question is, let's say you had this, your bill. So now I've given you this other tool. Your application now also will send out information about how it behaves. Uh, you can always access Jaeger uh, or other tools to, uh, to see that information. Do you think as bill, after you rolled out your feature, would that make you more likely to actually check how your feature works in production? No, exactly. That's true. So much to my chagrin, after I gave Bill access to open telemetry and all of that data, that was still not enough. And he was still not actually using it and continued to move on to the next feature every single time. So what's the reason for that? How do we actually um how do we actually solve that? So the problem, there is a one big problem and several small problems. And the, the small problems are easier to explain. Uh, one is expertise. So it's great to be able to see these traces, this data, and there are also metrics that you can get through open telemetry. So there's a lot of data, but not all of us are up to date on our statistics of 101 and not all of us can easily derive the P50, P99, um, remove the outliers and get to a very good understanding of how the application performs and whether my cha change was good or bad. The other thing is that I need to contact with. I need to study Jaeger, a completely new tool, uh, switch over to it after I finish doing my, uh, uh, kind of deploying my feature, 
And then also wait for users to actually use it and know when I need to check it. And also 99% of the time, there might be nothing interesting to find. Mm -hmm. Greatly kind of decreasing my motivation to, to check it out. Um, so all of those are the small reasons, but the last and big reason is that it's not continuous. So we have continuous integration because people don't need to remember <clears throat> to run their tests. It just happens automatically. We have continuous deployment so that people don't need to worry or or they don't they can't forget that deployment is across the, the corner. It just happens as a part of the release pipeline. And feedback too should be continuous. And this is kind of my own personal journey with um, a continuous feedback observability in open telemetry. So what bugged me uh, quite a bit was how can we get to a situation where developers don't actually need to think about the fact that they are going to hunt around for bugs or issues in dashboards, but it becomes a part of their daily work. And I'm going to show you a project that I'm working on, um, but um, this is there are other projects around this same topic because it's becoming something that's very important for a lot of developers out there. And the reason is because developers are owning more because it's not just about deploying, it's about owning your feature and how do you do it all the way to the yeah. So just to show you a quick demo of what that looks like, let's go to that same code uh, that I was using before. This is kind of uh, uh, VS Code with some, some of the uh, authentication code uh, that, that's running in production. And that's actually the most important thing I can say about this code because it's pretty trivial but it's already running. Now it passed all of the tests. I wrote a lot of tests and it passed all of them. And I'm very optimistic about this code, but I don't know, right? In a sense, when you all are, when I am working in my ID, <laughs> practically blind about all of these different things that are happening uh, with the code that I'm looking at right now. So what Digma does is provide continuous feedback. So I can enable it. And then look at the same code. Only this time, things start appearing that telling me what's going on with this code, really. Uh, and immediately, I can see a lot of things. I can see that there is an error hotspot here that's developing, which is interesting, right? Mm -hmm. I can see that there is a high usage in terms of concurrency. Mm -hmm. So I know which areas of the code need to be uh, adjusted to support concurrency as we saw. There is an n plus one situation here. For those of you who are familiar with it, it's queries, too many queries due to bad modeling uh, in, in a nutshell. And this entire thing is slowing down. So I could turn it off again, right? But I would essentially be coming back to the situation where I'm blind about how uh, this code works. Now, the tragedy is that this information existed all along. In showing this information, I did not invent anything. I just took the existing data and made it something that's transparent. And of course I can kind of explore all of that information and there's some runtime errors and I can understand exactly what's going on there. And there's some bottlenecks to be found and I can understand who's using it. And there's a lot of things to, to say about this code, which is the important thing. There's a lot of things to say about this code, but for some reason, Bill, the developer was not incorporating that into their day-to-day -day work. And this is what I am trying to change um, by actually making people aware of the fact that the information is there. And like, I'm trying to find ways to leverage it. There are many other tools that will let you do it. And the more important thing is, how do we get that uh, into our kind of, or incorporated into our day-to-day -day work so that we can improve the quality of our code um, and, and reduce issues? So what are the key takeaways? Um, the first and more, most important thing is to own your code. And this is, you know, I remember when I had to argue with developers and tell them that the testing is a part of their job and they were like, no, there's QA. And I would tell them, no, testing is a part of their job. And, and they said, no, QA. And it took a while for the industry at large to get over that hurdle and kind of get people to understand that yes, they own code and its quality. So you need to own, own your code and, and only code all the way to production is also a cultural change that I see happening right now. And this is why observability is becoming such a big thing. The other point is you need to harvest the observability data you have. If you don't harvest it, it doesn't matter. I've seen a lot of companies that 
are extremely good at collecting observability data, extremely good. But that's it, just collecting it. And it kind of withers away in, in databases or data dogs or other tools. And people either disregard it or think, you know, the dashboards are just nice images. It, it's not impactful. They need to harvest it. You need to actually use it. You need to implement feedback into your process. And this is my, the product manager in me speaking. So feedback needs to be incorporated. We have daily scrum, but we have no feedback meetings. There is no ritual and uh, agile methodology that everyone's adopted that says, we're gonna sit once a week and talk about the feedback that we've received from the features and see what else we need to get. And this is really important. Lastly, and the last and most important thing that you can do is join the thinking. So we created a, a Slack group for continuous feedback, which is uh, the topic that, uh, that we're trying to basically create practices around. So if you're interested in more tools that are available, open source tools that you can use to get continuous feedback and incorporate it into your uh, work, um, please join us. And, mm -hmm. and we'd love to hear kind of your own experiences and uh, definitely uh, happy to, to answer any questions there as well. Thank you. Thank you.